have no defense My guilt runs too deep The best of my works pierced your hands and your feet Jesus, your mercy is all my plea
the chains of darkness who can say To bring salvation You gave, you gave Your life to free us You are the light Then you came as a man To the earth that you had made On the cross you gave your life The darkness seemed to have its way But then you rose in victory Death defeated Who can say? Who can wake us from our slumber? Who can say? Good morning, St. Andrews, and welcome to church this morning. My name's Andrew Reese. I'm the Senior Minister here at St. Andrews. I'm Josh Lewis, the Assistant here. It's great to have you with us wherever you're joining us from. And um, if you're new or you've only been watching for a couple of weeks, please do let us know. Um, send us an email at live at sanandies.org.au. Um, it's great to have you with us. Now, if you have been watching for a couple of weeks, you've probably noticed we're not in the church building. Um, this week and next week, we're uh, pre-recording uh, right. our services, yes. uh, just as they put the, uh, the finishing touches just the icing on the new on building. The cake, really. yeah. yeah, the carpet on the floor, <laughs> the icing on the yeah. cake. Yeah, yeah. We're almost there, and we're really looking forward to that. Uh, October the 18th is uh, the big opening celebration. We're going to have four services across that day: nine, eleven, three, and five. They'll all be the same, so that's designed to have plenty of space for everyone to to come and be part of it. Our registrations are open on the website now, so go uh, go there as soon as you can and register for one of those services. And in the lead up to October 18, in, in the weeks leading up to it and in the two weeks after, we're going to spend some time on Sundays uh, refocusing on uh, what our mission is uh, together as a church to remember uh, what we're about as we start this new season of ministry where we're back in the building uh, we've been apart for months, uh, six months really, and we want to say this is what we're about and recommit to that together and pray uh, that God would bless our endeavours uh, for his glory. Here's our mission uh, in, in four statements really. Uh, we're a church family that is welcomed by Jesus, growing by grace, 
declaring his praises and longing for home. And so each week we want to focus on a different aspect of that. And the goal of that is to commit together to those things that we might glorify God uh, in this place and from this place to the community around us. And what better way to start than with this uh, brilliant old hymn, which says that all that we do is uh, meant to be focused on God and for his glory. So let's listen together to Be Thou My Vision. Be Thou My Vision, that's our goal together as a church family, to have everything we do uh, focused on God and for His glory. And so that's why we're taking these weeks to reset our uh, focus on the mission that God has given us to honour Him in this place. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And over these four weeks, we're going to be, I guess, talking about the words of the mission quite a lot because we want it to become a thing that, um, I guess, animates all we do here as a church, something that everyone knows and everyone's able yeah, to kind keep, of keep explain. it to be part of our conversation where yeah, we say yeah. this is what we're about and to know what we're about uh, together yeah so here it is again uh, we're a church family welcomed by jesus growing by grace declaring his praises longing for home yep and this week yep. we're looking at the, the welcome first by statement jesus. welcome by jesus yep. We are a church family, welcomed by Jesus. He's the reason we are here. We were estranged, far off, unwelcome. Some of us seem to be off the rails. Others of us seem to have life sorted, but all of our hearts were turned inwards against God. 
all of us were outsiders when it came to God. And yet Jesus came, God in the flesh. He was rejected, outcast, unwelcome, judged for us. He shared His precious blood to bring us back, to welcome us. He defeated death, rising from the grave, never to die again. Our hope of welcome is sure because Jesus is alive. We hear the news of what God has done in Jesus and we believe. That's how it happens. For some, it's a slow journey over many years. For others, it's like a bolt of lightning, but it means we're different to how we were. Born again, new people, welcomed into a new life and with a new family. The young and the old, singles and married, here for ages and those who've just arrived, the loud and the quiet, those who have plenty and those who are in lack, those who are sorted and those who are stuck, but all forgiven, all thankful, all family, welcomed by Jesus. Well, throughout this uh, series, we're going to be looking at our mission through the lens of the first couple of chapters of 1 Peter. Uh, So we're going to read uh, 1 Peter 1 and and part of 2 together now. Um, If you've got a Bible, please do get it out and and turn to 1 Peter so you can follow along. But I'm reading from 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 uh, from verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For 
All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Hello, St Andrews. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your very great mercy to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that through that mercy we have been born again into your family, born again to, into a living hope that will never perish, spoil or fade. We pray, Father, that as we hear your living and enduring word today, that we would grow up in our salvation, grow up in the purposes that you have for us as your people, declaring your praises in this world. So humble us now, Father. Humble us as we hear your word, that we would hear it as it is, the word of the living God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, after 12 months of construction and uh, six months of separation because of COVID-19, I really cannot wait to get back together in the morning congregations of our church family on October the 18th. That's the day we're going to celebrate the opening of the new buildings and the resumption of physical gatherings. I hope you've had time to register for that. If not, please do that as soon as you can. What we want to do, though, in the lead up to October 18 and in the couple of Sundays after is to recommit, refocus on what our mission together as a church is, the mission that God has given us. And I think it's a mission uh, described brilliantly for us in the chapters of 1 Peter, chapter 1 and 2. And that's where we're going to set up camp over the next few weeks. So I do encourage you to be reading it during the week. Read 1 Peter. Read what it says about God's mercy. Read what it says about the purpose of that mercy for us as his church. So let me encourage you to turn to that now, 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2. And as you turn to that, let, let me share with you my prayer for our church family on the back of what we read here. I'm praying that we will humbly live as those who have been welcomed into God's family by faith in Jesus Christ. I'm praying that we be a church that continues to grow up in our salvation by obeying the word that we hear. I'm praying that uh, we'd be a church that in both life and speech declare God's praises wherever we go. And I'm praying that we would be a church that is marked uh, by those who are waiting, hope-filled waiters, uh, longing for his return, longing for our home and our hope that is kept safe for us in heaven. I wonder if you'd pray that with me. Now pray it because it's actually who we are because of God's great mercy. Pray it because it's who he is calling us to be as we live as his people in this world. Uh, we are, and here's our mission statement that you would have heard throughout this service, we are a church family welcomed by Jesus, growing by grace, declaring his praises and longing for home. That's the marks of this church family. That's the marks of our mission. And over the next four weeks, I want to look at each of those marks in turn. And today we're, we'll start with the first of them, that we are a church welcomed by Jesus. 
And so let me encourage you to turn to 1 Peter, chapter 1 and 2, and that's where we will uh, see this mark of our church. As you turn to 1 Peter, here's the message of 1 Peter, uh, chapter 1 and 2, in, in just a few short sentences. We are a church that God is building. No, not a church building. We are a church that God is building as he welcomes us into his family by faith in Jesus Christ. We are those who are born again by the living word of God. We are those who are redeemed by the precious blood of God. And we are filled with a hope that is certain because of the resurrection of Jesus. His people declaring him to a world that is without him and so is without hope. That's who we are as a church. That's what 1 Peter shows us. Uh, This is a church built on God's very great mercy. That's St Andrews. And if someone was to ask, uh, what what does coming to church involve? What what would it mean to come to St Andrews or come to really any church uh, that is the living church? The explanation would would not be this. It would not be about tradition. If you were to describe what coming to church is about, it's not about tradition. It's it's not about Anglicanism. It's, It's not about North Shore life. It's not about a human institution. It's not even about religion. Coming to church is about coming to Jesus. And I remember very clearly, clear as a bell, uh, the night that I first came to Jesus, uh, it was October, about 32 years ago, in a church not far from here. And in one sense, uh, the moment uh, that I did come to Jesus by faith uh, was a personal moment, uh, a moment where I made a decision in my mind. I'd examined the evidence of who Jesus is and what he had done, and I said, yeah, I accept that, I believe that. And so I made a decision. But it was more than just a a personal mental decision. It was a relational decision. That was the moment I entered into a living relationship with God. And I did that by praying. I prayed to him about the things that I had decided. I I repented before him. I I, I repented of living as if I was king rather than the truth. I I, I asked for his forgiveness because of Jesus. I, I said, please, you take the lead from now on. And in that moment, I made peace with God. So it was more than just a moment for me to decide something. It was a moment for me to enter into that relationship uh, of peace with God through Jesus. But it was more than even just that, more than just a God and me moment. Uh, I remember opening my eyes after praying that prayer one Sunday night. And as I looked around, there was a church filled with people uh, that were God's people. and, And now they were my people. I'd entered into this people. I was now part of his church. And so St Andrews is not first and foremost about coming to a place or a building. It's about coming to Jesus and through him coming to God as Father, coming to his people, his church. That's what it means to come to this place. And how do we come to Jesus? Well, the answer is simple and wonderful. Uh, He welcomes us. He invites us. And from 1 Peter, I want to show you three aspects of this welcome that, that marks this place, our church. Uh, Firstly, this, uh, it's a welcome he gives to us by his word. He speaks it. I love this. This this welcome uh, to God as our father is is not something we can do ourselves. We can't make ourselves welcome. It's not that sort of deal. It's his sovereign choice. He chooses to welcome us, to invite us. Uh, There's nothing hidden about it. There's nothing in doubt. He speaks. He says, come. I mean, how good it is uh, in life, isn't it, to know for sure that you're welcome somewhere. Uh, How hard it is to not know that for sure, to to not feel welcome. I remember years ago traveling around Ireland with some friends and uh, a a particular friend of mine, Scott, and I decided to go on a tour of Lansdowne Road, the famous rugby field in in Dublin. And and so we we headed there and uh, Scott had taken a a rugby ball with him. I don't know why he decided to bring the rugby ball with him all the way across the world, but there we were at Lansdowne Road. And and we we turned up for the tour, but there was no sign of the tour. And so we wandered up towards the ground and there's a gate uh, onto the ground and it's open. And we thought, well, maybe the tour is started and so we headed onto the ground and looked around no nobody to be seen and so eventually we gave up on the tour and we said well let's just reenact some famous wallaby moments on this ground and so I scored a try in the corner like Michael Liner did many years ago and and then Scott decided he was going to take a kick for goal and so I stood behind the goals and he lined himself up and what he couldn't see but I could was that behind him there was a security guard heading towards him at pace and I'm waving madly at Scott trying to get his attention but he's focused on the kick and eventually when the security guard caught up with us he he said this I'm not going to try the Irish accent but he essentially said you are not welcome here 
You've no right to be here. Get off the field, you idiot. And off we went, hightailing away from there as quick as possible. That's what it feels like to not be welcome, to presume a welcome. But I remember a number of years later when we, we as a family moved to the UK, Sheffield, we'd never been there before in our lives. And uh, we landed at Manchester Airport on the 1st of January, 2007. And there we are, the whole family standing on the curb of Manchester Airport out the front. And around the corner comes this huge van and the window winds down and a guy called Tim, who was part of the church that we were going to be at, uh, he, he wound down the window and he says, I'm where the welcome wagon. And we piled in and the kids slept for the, what, the first time in about 30, 30 hours. And then when we eventually got to Sheffield and we were shown our home where we were going to live and the door opens and there's this huge banner, welcome to the Reese family. And then later that night, another knock on the door and a hot meal for us. And day after day in the, the days that followed, uh, knocks on the door, welcoming us uh, to that place, saying, it's good you're here. How good it is to feel welcome. And here's the thing about our God and about this church that you are a part of. God has made his welcome clear to us. He speaks it. There's no doubt. And throughout the scriptures, it is the constant refrain that God speaks. Uh, all throughout Jesus' ministry, one of, one of the, the most common things he says, uh, you see it especially in John's gospel, as people are investigating what it would be to have a relationship with God. He simply says this, come and see. Come and see for yourself. And then right at the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 17, one of my favourite verses, it simply says this, God says, anyone who's thirsty, come. Anyone who's thirsty, come and drink. The invitation, uh, the invitation of welcome from God is, is uh, relentless. It's over and over again. He leaves us in no doubt of this invitation. And how does this welcome reach us? Well, it reaches us through his word. And do you see it there in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23? It says there, for you have been born again, that is entered into God's family as his children. You've been born again, welcomed into that family through the living and enduring word of God. That's how God welcomes us into his family. He speaks it. He leaves us in no doubt. And that's what he's doing here at St. Andrews. That's the mark of this church. He's welcoming people by this word. And he's not just doing it here. He's, he's actually doing it all throughout the world. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 6 says this message of the gospel, this welcome that God speaks in our world, it says it's bearing fruit and multiplying all over the earth. He's welcoming more and more. And so it's not unique to St. Andrews. It is as uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 25 says, it's a word that he preaches. And as it's preached throughout this world, he, he's welcoming people. So he's doing that. He's speaking that welcome in Bolivia through our mission partners there. He's speaking it in Cambodia, in, in the nations of Africa. He's speaking it in the country towns of Australia. He's, he's speaking it in Fairfield. He's saying, come, any who are thirsty, come. And do you notice how God's word here in verse 23 of 1 Peter is called uh, the living word? And that gives you a sense of uh, the power of this word. It's like a seed that brings life to this world. Uh, verse 23, new life, we're told. Life like we've never had before. Life where we're in relationship with God. Uh, life, verse 21, where we have faith and hope in God. That's the mark of this life, the, the invitation he gives. That's what he invites us to. And he does it by speaking this living word, this life-changing word about his son, about Jesus. And I hope you've had the joy in this place, uh, whether you've been here just a, a, a short time or a long time, of seeing this word change people here, seeing that welcome take place. Uh, I remember in the last year or so, a lady who, uh, who'd gone on a Christianity Explored course here, but also had been meeting up with someone in the church family who'd simply just opened the Bible with her and they'd read it together. And any of us can do that with someone. And, and over time, this lady, as she read the Bible, she came to trust Jesus. She received this welcome. That same process that I talked about for myself in that church uh, 32 years ago, it happened for this lady. And I remember bumping into her a while ago in the dog park and she was so excited by what she was reading for herself in the Bible. She says, you know, I, I end up going on longer and longer walks just so I can hear more and more of this word. I mean, it's the picture we have here in 1 Peter. Do you see it there in uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 1 and 2? It says there, we're like newborn babies craving spiritual milk that's going to grow us. And that, that's this lady's experience. How, what a joy it is to see this welcome take place. And I hope beyond that as well, I hope you've had the joy of seeing the word changing you, continuing to change you. 
I remember uh, for myself, uh, around a, a year or so after becoming a Christian, I just started reading the Bible for myself and I got on a, a Duke of Edinburgh camp with some, some friends and uh, we were in the Gross River Valley, I think it was, in the, in the Blue Mountains. And one morning before breakfast, I decided to get up and, and go head somewhere and read the Bible. So there we were near the river and there was this huge gum tree that had sort of fallen across the river and I sort of clambered onto the, the tree and I sat in the mi- middle of this enormous river on this enormous gum tree and opened my little New Testament that I had with me and read the book of James. And I remember being blown away by it, uh, the, the picture of a God who gives wisdom from above, wisdom that we need for life. And I, I remember praying, I want that wisdom, God. I remember just a, a few years later after that, uh, reading for the first time 2 Corinthians 5 about this ministry of reconciliation that God gives us as his people calling to the world, this invitation of welcome, asking them, saying, please be reconciled to God. Hear this word of welcome. And I remember thinking, you know what, that's it. That's what I want to do with my life. That's my life sorted. That, that's my job right there. God's word of invitation doesn't just welcome people Uh, initially into his family, it invites us to keep growing in our relationship with our heavenly father. So that, do you see it there in chapter two, verse two, that we would grow up in our salvation. We're we're all still doing that. Uh, It's amazing, isn't it? The word that God spoke that brought life into this world is the word that he speaks that brings new life to us, uh, increasing life over time. And if you're someone who's not sure that you have that life in you, you're not sure you have a relationship with God as Father, then I invite you, even as we read this right now together, to hear his word of welcome, to hear this invitation, to accept Jesus as your saviour and as your king, to trust him. And the only way that call to come to him is going to be heard clearly by any of us is through this word, because this is the word he speaks about Jesus. Uh, about the one who will lead us to the Father. And what right now, uh, and what right, uh, what right do we have to come to the Father for ourselves? If this, this is the invitation, the welcome to come to the Father, the answer is absolutely none. No right. None of us have any right. It's sort of a Lansdowne Road moment. Who, how, who do we think we are that we can just walk onto the field, walk into God's family and say, I'm here, I'm welcome. And yet the welcome comes. It's a miracle. And again, it is his word that makes clear how that welcome can come to us. And this is the second aspect of the welcome I want us to see from 1 Peter. It's a welcome made possible by his blood. Here's the wonder of the gospel welcome that his word speaks to us. Yes, this invitation is his to give. It's his sovereign choice. We don't make ourselves welcome. He brings the invitation. And yes, it's incredibly kind of him to do it, but, but we must see this. It also is an invitation that comes at incredible cost to God. You see it there in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus. That's how the welcome comes to us. And so I want to say to us, brothers and sisters, do not be ignorant, no matter how long you've been a Christian, do not be ignorant or lose sight of the fact that of the immense price the father had to pay and the griefs that he went to to enable him to be able to give us this welcome. Uh, It came at great cost. Uh, What was the cost for? Well, here's the truth of it. You and I were not created to live by ourselves or for ourselves. You were created for a relationship with God as Father. That's what you were made for. You were created to live under his good rule, a rule that you can trust. Uh, You were created to glorify him with your life rather than glorify yourself. This is not about you, it's about him. That's what you were created for. And I reckon we balk at that. What sort of God uh, puts himself at the centre? What sort of God uh, lives for his own glory? And I get that, but... But let me ask you this in response. Who else would you have him glorify? You? Me? Perhaps us together. I mean, what a skewed view of reality to think that we would be at the centre of the universe uh, that God has created. We're not made for that. 
We're not made for that. It's not good for us either. But, but we all have done that. We've lived for our own praise. We live for our own glory. We teach our children to seek it for themselves. And we feel crushed when we don't receive it. It feels like a natural thing. We, we're meant to be honoured. All the while, we neither acknowledge God nor give him thanks. We live in this world. And we say, I'll take all of this and none of you. And the Bible's word for that is sin. This is a God-centred universe in which we were made for a relationship with him. We were made to obey him and trust him as king, and, and yet we don't. That's the problem. We are uh, later in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 18, we'll be described this way as the unrighteous. We're not right with God. The, we can't presume to walk up and uh, receive a welcome. Uh, we are under his judgment and therefore have no right to be welcomed. That's the truth of it. The truth is that our sin has created a wall between us and God and, and the Bible leaves us in absolutely no doubt about the consequences of that sin. Uh, uh, the book of Romans says the wages of our sin is our own death. The wrath of God is on the unrighteous, that's us. and We've absolutely nothing to offer in our defence, no excuse, none whatsoever. It's empty, the empty way of life that we have. We've got nothing to say, see, this, this was a worthy life. No, it wasn't because we were made to glorify him. But here's the miracle of this place. Here's the miracle. This church is not built on merit, but on mercy, very great mercy. We are welcomed at great cost by Jesus. You see there in 1 Peter 1, 19 there, here's the cost. Here's how the welcome is made possible. It is by the precious blood of Jesus. Uh, or if you uh, read further into 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, you hear it described this way. Here's a brilliant memory verse to have in your head. For Christ died for all, the righteous, that's God, for the unrighteous, that's us, to bring you to God. That's the purpose of it, to, to enable this welcome. Christ died to secure your welcome. He died to smash this wall of sin between us and God and, and only he could because he's the only one of whom God the Father could say, this is my son whom I love and I'm well pleased. He's perfect. On the cross, he takes your place. On the cross, he pays your price. And how sure can you be that that is enough? How sure can you be of, of welcome? Well, here, here's how sure. God raised his son from death, raised him to say, yes, I accept my son's life for yours. Enough, it's finished. And if you currently live with no relationship with God as Father, if you do not know him as Father, if you have not experienced this welcome, know that there is no greater question for you right now than this. Do you trust him, Jesus, that he shed his blood to win you back, to bring you back to God? And so I want to say as we think about our mission as a church and we look at this first aspect of it, this St Andrews, this is a wonderful place. I love this church. I hope you love it too. It's wonderful, not in the sense that it's, well, full of perfect people. No, it's not wonderful at all in that way, but it's full of wonder, miraculous, merciful wonder. You have come back to God by this blood. That's the wonder of this place. This, this place is actually the polar opposite of Lansdowne Road, isn't it? Because of Jesus, we are welcomed by God. We are his forgiven children. There, there's no doubt on that. There's no tap on the shoulder like Scott received uh, coming to say, uh, asking us to leave, saying we've got no right to be there. I may look like an imposter. My, my sin might expose me as an imposter again and again, but, but it's not true anymore. I'm free to stay. He's paid the price. Here at St Andrews, uh, none of us come as we think we are. We come as he has made us by faith in Jesus. We come as those redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus, those welcomed to God the Father by that blood. Who am I here? Who are you? We are welcomed by Jesus. And next week uh, we're going to see that this welcome has a purpose a huge purpose, a mission that God has given us as a result of this welcome. And, and we're going to see that through three metaphors that these early chapters of 1 Peter present uh, about who we are. It says there, and here's what we'll see in the next few weeks, we're welcomed so that we might be a family that loves deeply and keeps growing. We're welcomed so that we might be a temple that offers lives that please God. And thirdly, we're welcome that we might be a people that declare his praises to the world. That's our purpose. That's our mission. 
That's next week. But, but as we close, uh, let me close by sharing one more thing about this welcome that we've received that's hugely important to grasp. And I think if you read these chapters, and I do encourage you to be reading them, it'll be impossible to miss. This is a welcome that is future focused. Now, let me ask you, uh, which direction do you view life from? Now, that's a weird question, isn't it? But uh, go with me on it for a second. Which direction, which perspective do you view life from? Uh, I think the answer to that all depends upon where you think the best of life is. Uh, perhaps some of us view life from the past. Uh, perhaps we view life through a, a golden era, a golden phase of life that, that was just the best of life that we've had and we wish we could have that again. And there's a sort of wistful longing to go back even though we, we know we can't. But, but here's the thing, the Christian life is not lived from that view. Or, or some of us, it's all about now. It's all about the present. We're, we're absorbed and focused on, on the present. Uh, and, and, and when we live that way, it leads to anxious striving for the now, to reach some stage in the present, to, to gain some success, to be somebody that we think we have to be. And it, it, it's a life, and th- this is our world really, isn't it? A life of anxious movement and relentless busyness and fearful comparison. I wonder if you know that feeling. But here's the thing. The Christian life is not viewed from there. No, our welcome, our hope is ultimately future focused. That's the lens before us in 1 Peter. That's the lens. If you read uh, the opening verses, uh, verses 3 to 9 of chapter 1, we see there that we've been welcomed by Jesus into a hope where, here's the truth of it, the best is yet to come. It's in the future, it's there, it's yet to come. You see the way it's described in those opening verses? It's a hope in the future that's unperishing. A hope that that won't die because it's secured by the one who conquered death and now lives forever. It can't perish anymore. It's a hope, we're told, that's unspoiled. It can't be ruined by our sin. How good is that? You can't stuff this hope up. He secured it by his blood. And, and then there's this, it's a hope that's unfading. It's kept in heaven for you. It's still there in the future. It's guarded. You, you can't lose it. It won't, it won't go out of sight. The Christian life uh, is lived forward. It's lived in full view of this future hope. We are redeemed from the past. We don't have to worry about the past. We're redeemed from the past. We're secured in the future. And, and we'll see more of this next week, that radically changes the present. Now the present for the Christian, now the present for his people, the church, pulses with purpose. It's a present, no, it's not a present not full of anxious striving anymore, but it is, uh, it is full of joyful anticipation because we know the best is yet to come. And so do you see it there in those opening verses, verses 6 and 7? It means that because of this future focus, even as trials come at us, uh, we rejoice because we know he's using them to prepare us for home. The best is yet to come. And and then perhaps my favourite verse in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1 verse 8, it's future focused in the sense of this joyful anticipation, the joyful reunion that is coming for us when we will see the one who made the welcome possible, we will see him face to face, we will be with Jesus. And you see the way it's described there, verse 8, how good is this verse? Speaking of Jesus, it says, though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, not yet, even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Let me ask you, do you anticipate the moment when you will actually be welcomed home, literally be welcomed home by Jesus? You know, when Finn uh, years ago started school in the UK, uh, home time was a big deal for him in those opening weeks. So he was always keen to know who was going to be there, what time was it going to be, how was it going to work? And um, most afternoons Liz would pick him up. But after a few weeks, so I, uh, I, I took over on Fridays. That became the day I picked him up. And I remember the first time it was my turn to do it on a Friday. Uh, that morning, Finn was a little bit worried that I, that I wouldn't know what to do. And so he, he, uh, he was keen to talk me through the procedure. This is where I'm going to be and this is what you've got to do, Dad. And eventually I had to say to him, look, I, I promise when the time comes, I'm going to be there. And so the time came, 3.15, and out came Finn with the rest of his class and his teacher, and uh, he's scanning around, uh, and, and then he sees me. And his face beams, and he starts waving his arms like a crazy man, and he grabs his teacher's hand and says, that's my dad. But uh, Finn was stoked. 
I remember looking around and all, none of the other parents are carrying on like that. So I thought I better play it cool. And so I'm saying, come on, Finn, come on, Finn. But he is absolutely just delirious with joy. It's home time. And here's the thing. Jesus, when it comes to the time for us to come home, will have no such inhibitions as I did that day. It was actually the very reason he came. It's the reason he paid the price. Do you know what Hebrews 2, 12 verse 2 says? It says, it, it was the joy set before him as he endured the shame of the cross. It was the joy of this moment of welcome that is yet to come for us. He longs for that moment of welcome. He, he longs for that reunion when we will be with him and with his father. And let me encourage you as a church, let us join him in living life from that view. Who are we? We are those who are welcomed by Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, well, simply and wonderfully for this welcome that we have received, that you have spoken to us clearly in your word, that you have made possible by the blood of your Son, and we know the best is yet to come. So fix our hearts and minds and lives on that welcome yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, we're going to spend a little time in prayer now. Uh, so... Uh, there's going to be some prayer points, six prayer points actually, that are going to come up on the screen. And if you could spend some time praying to our God, uh, just where you are, with, with whoever you're with, um, we'll be back with you in about five minutes.
please keep praying for our mission together that God has given us to honour him in this place and uh, from this place as we reach out to the community around us. Next week, we'll be looking at the next aspect of the mission, growing by grace Mm -hmm. together Mm -hmm. uh, as his church family here. So please read 1 Peter 1 and 2. That's where we're going to be over these next few weeks. And uh, October the 18th? Yeah, that's right. October the 18th, four uh, different celebration services, different times, but same service. Uh, So 9, 11, 3 and 5. Yep. And at the 9 o'clock, and the three o'clock, there are uh, there's kids programs. That's right. Yeah. Um, so all of them are the same. Uh, please register for one of those. Yeah. Uh, and if you could do that as quickly as you can, that would be great. That'd so we can uh, yep. organise how the yep. day is going to look. Uh, but that's a and sp- they can do that on the website. They that's, can. That's where to go. Yeah, that's right. Yep. To to register. That'll be a special uh, yeah. celebration on the eighteenth. Looking 18th. forward to that. Yep. Uh, then we're going to finish our mission series with the two weeks after that. The two after weeks after that. that. Yep. Those, ah. those final parts of that mission statement, yeah. which I'm sure by now you've got committed yeah, uh, yeah, to memory. Yeah. Or by the end of this series, we hope hope everyone will have it as part of the language that we use as we talk about what we're about mm. as a church family. I, I'm going to pray mm-hmm. and ask God uh, to bless us as we go about uh, that mission for his glory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your very great mercy to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have been welcomed into your family, into your people, uh, because of Jesus and because of his precious blood shed for us. Uh, We thank you for him, and we pray, Father, that as we hear your living word and learn more about him, that we would grow up in our salvation, that we would grow uh, more like you, uh, grow in holiness, grow in obedient trust to you and your purposes. And we pray as that we do that, we would be more and more distinct in this world, that we would shine as lights in this world, that we would uh, declare your praises by the way we live and what we say of the one who has called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. And Father, we pray as we do that, that we would know that we are not home yet, that we long for the day that as, as your people, as your dearly loved children, that we would be at home with you. So we pray that all that we do is with that heart that longs for home. So, Father, help us to honour you uh, this week for your glory's sake. Amen.